Rolling along with our Black History Month series. I'm Sam Brief, and I'm honored, really honored to be joined today by Mrs. Karen Freeman Wilson, who's the president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League, also former mayor of the great town of Gary, Indiana. And Mayor K, Mrs. Freeman Wilson, I'm, I'm really honored to have you on. Well, I'm glad to be here with you, Sam. Um, love Chicago State and what you all are doing there. So I'm honored, in fact, to join you. Thank you. I'm glad the honor is mutual and I'm excited to dive right into it. So let's do that. And I wanna start with the organization that you represent, right? The Chicago Urban League, which has such a, a rich, robust history here in Chicago. Let's start with that. For people who aren't familiar, how would you describe the mission of the Urban League? So I would describe the mission of the Urban League in a couple of ways. First, our overall mission is to fight for social justice and racial equity uh, for Black families and other underserved communities. And we do that in three ways. We are a convener. Um, in fact, uh, right now we are working on a black policy agenda with a number of leaders, including your own president, uh, Z. Scott. But in addition to that, we do programming in a variety of areas, uh, workforce development, housing, entrepreneurship, leadership development, youth services. And then we also have uh, one of the only research and policy shops in the city that is focused solely on Black people. Uh, we were one of the first entities to publish a paper on the impact of COVID-19 in May of 2020 that really honed in on not just the medical impact of COVID, but the impact of COVID on our working, on our uh, living, on our um, you know, schooling or education, on all aspects of our lives. So it strikes me that you're building a historical archive in a way. I mean, that's something that I'm just flash forwarding, let's say a hundred years from now, right? People will read that research, read that report. Um, and and it's, it's sort of taking stock of history as we go, right? Absolutely. Um, we are building a historical archive. In that archive is a um, paper that talks about the cost of segregation. In that archive is the state of Black America or the state of Black Chicago in, for many, many years. Uh, the last time we did it was 2019. We're doing it again, 2022. Uh, this time we're going to focus on the cost of being Black, uh, essentially saying that there are things uh, that cost more because of race. And we're gonna talk about those things and not only um, why that exists, but how to mitigate that cost uh, to members of the Black community. And nothing can happen until the conversation starts, right? And Black History Month, which we've, we've just plunged into, is an opportunity to start a conversation, right? A conversation that allows me to have a conversation with you uh, and get things out in the open. I'm curious for you as, as someone representing this organization, how important the conversation is. Well, we relish the opportunity to have the conversation because you're absolutely right. You can't do anything until the conversation begins. And while some people only have that conversation during Black History Month, those of us at the Urban League and at Chicago State know that this is a six, 365 day a year conversation. But if you engage in that conversation, whenever that is, it means that you're focused on an issue. And if you determine from that conversation that the issue needs to be attended to either through developing solutions, either through uh, developing some form of mitigation, 
then that's the next step after the conversation. How do we get to that next step? Well, I think that when we have the conversation about some of the challenges that face us, we have to have um, a sense of determination that we have to do better collectively, that um, we owe our children better in terms of education, that we owe our uh, businesses better in terms of the disparities that impact uh, black businesses that we owe our health care uh, or ho ho owe our health outcomes more in terms of the uh, challenges that we find in health equity. And once you determine that uh, better has to occur, then you can devise, you know, what are the resources that are needed? Who are the best uh, organizations and entities and individuals who can contribute to those solutions? And how do we come together to uh, work in one direction? You know, everybody can contribute something to a solution, but unless you are contributing in a concerted way, uh, building on each solution, then you're just basically throwing things against the wall. And, you know, I, firmly believe in collective solution uh, building. That's a really interesting point, that, that idea of being collective. Because if, if I'm doing one thing and you're doing one thing and it's, this guy's doing the next thing, like it's all splattered and, and you need that one direction, that one flow to make progress. Yeah, it doesn't mean that if you do it separately, you're not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm just making the case that if you do it together, you'll make a bigger difference. And one way to get a lot of people on board and together and in line is education, right? And there's obviously formal education, you know, when you go to elementary school, high school, college here at Chicago State, maybe. But then there's the education that organizations like the Urban League are undertaking. So I'm curious, Ms. Freeman Wilson, what your stance is, or maybe stance isn't the right word. It's sort of what your philosophy is, I suppose, regarding education, both formally and on the fly? You know, um, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think it's extremely important. Certainly we want to promote formal education um, all that we can, whether it is the development of institutions like Chicago State and supporting institutions like Ch Chicago State, uh, widening, uh, or increasing the opportunity for those who want to, who uh, believe that they desire to achieve higher education after high school, we wanna do that. But I think that a lot of times we overlook the opportunity for informal education. As an example, uh, this is Black History Month. And one of the things that we're going to bring to the community by way of education is a look at the housing market and the impact of under appraisals or undervaluing property in black neighborhoods. That's a form of education that is free because we're not charging. Uh, we are making it widely available to the public, but it's something that can impact again, the community widely, because a lot of people don't even know that their homes are being undervalued. Mm -hmm. And um, as we think about the importance of building wealth in the black community, this is a critical issue that we have to address. So again, um, you can get education about that in the business school at Chicago State, right? Because that's all about re real estate, but you can also get it through a conversation with experts through the Chicago Urban League. Now, that's really fascinating to me because education, we think of so formally, right? And it happens in, in sure. so many ways. And um, that, that, that's fascinating that um, you're offering it in sort of these bite-sized chunks, but they're super important. A bite-sized chunk can go a long way. And you mentioned Chicago State and the role of 
this institution on the south side of Chicago. Zoning in on Chicago and the university here, what do you see as the importance of a, a PBI, a predominantly black institution like Chicago State on the south side of this city of Chicago? I think that when you think about the importance of Chicago State as a predominantly black institution that is in the heart of the south side, you have to um, understand the importance of accessibility. And uh, I mean accessibility in its uh, most expansive definition. The fact that as a kindergartner, as an elementary school student, as a middle school, high school student, I see this massive campus. In my neighborhood, I began to think about the fact that I have access to higher education right in my neighborhood. So often when people think about college, they think about going away, going to another community, to another city. The reality is that college is accessible right in our backyards. In addition to that, we have to think about the fact that um, for so many, college has been deemed to be um, beyond their, uh, beyond, it, it's been deemed to be unaffordable. That's not true with, with Chicago State. It's not free, it's, although it is free to some, but it's more affordable than many of the other institutions. And then when you think about the ability to really um, get an education that directs you back to the community. You know, I think about graduates of Chicago State like Dr. Janice Jackson, who has served her community with distinction. And I have to think that part of that is because of the fact that she went to Chicago State and she was directed towards the needs of the community in her education at Chicago State. Right. It's you, you drive around and you see, look, that's college, right? It's right there. It's yeah. not this far off fantasy land in a different place. It, it, it's right there and it's accessible. That's exactly and right. That's certainly true here on the south side of Chicago. Ms. Freeman Wilson, it's been an honor to talk to you. I was, like I said, honored to have you on and honored to learn so much from you. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for the invitation. As I indicated, it's an honor to join with you today. And I can't tell you how much we appreciate the partnership between Chicago State and the Chicago Urban League. Thank you very much. Thank you.